Good morning. I um, I don't think I was on last week. Yeah, I had only seen one film last week, and I didn't really have anything to say about it. It was Vox Lux, starring Natalie Portman. And um, what can I say? I, I didn't dislike the film. I didn't really like the film all that much. It was I was very much in the middle. It's um. I, you know what, I still, I don't know, I, I really don't know what to say about it. I think that for the director, I can't remember the director's name offhand, I thought this was only his second or his third film. I thought, okay, the guy really, he went for the brass ring, he almost got it. I, so I admire him for, you know what, at least making an ambitious film. Didn't quite work though, for me. So, I don't know, you know, so I thought to myself, I didn't have a lot to say, and last week I was busy anyway, so I said, okay, I'm not going to do my video thing. But I have a couple films to talk about that opened yesterday in Hong Kong, and one of them is opening today uh, in North America and in most other uh, markets around the world, so I can talk about those two. We're still in the uh, Avengers Afterglow. I read yesterday that um, it's uh, almost, it's, num it's the number two uh, highest grossing movie ever. It dethroned um, uh, James Cameron's film Titanic. And now it's catching up to the leader, which is also James Cameron's film Avatar. And um, not that far behind, it's, um, but it's questionable. I, I think it it'll do it. It'll dethrone Avatar. Um, may take a couple more weeks. To do it already, it's the fastest film to reach two billion dollars. It did it a month before Avatar did it, um, so you know it's possible. I and well, I think it will happen, and just as well because I can't stand James Cameron. Ever since he went on the Oscars and said, "I'm the king of the world," um, and a lot of other reasons. So, <laughs> so that's what's happening. All right. So we don't have a lot happening in Hong Kong because still there's so many cinemas. So many screens are being filled with Avengers films. So there's a couple of films that opened yesterday. One is a German film called Never Look Away. I won't uh, murder the German language by telling you what's it, what its title is in German, but the title means uh, work without an author, like an artistic work without an author. And um, if, you, you know, if you've seen Avengers Endgame, you know that it pushed your bladder control to its limits, being three hours and two minutes. This one is three hours and eight minutes. <laughs> so <laughs> hopefully you've had good, a uh, good opportunity with Avengers Endgame to get your bladder control at, at you know, at uh, highest efficiency, um, because this one's really going to push you to the limits again. I think because of, of its long running time it's an, and a German film, I don't think it's going to get a lot of traction here. I don't think it's going to get a lot of traction anywhere. Um, it hasn't done very well in Germany, apparently. Even though it was Germany's um, submission, it was nominated for Best Foreign Language uh, Film at the Oscars this past year. So, um, it, you know, and it, it was already, it was up for two Oscars. Both of them competing against the film Roma, lost to, both lost to Roma. Um, so you know what? It's being it's it's being respected. It's being honored. Um, many many uh, critics who are far more uh, influential, let's say, than I am, are calling this a masterpiece. So you might want to see it. You know, it's directed by, uh, written, uh, by also co-written or written and directed by Oscar winner Florian Henkel von Donnersmark, who did the fabulous film The Lives of Others. I think it's like 20 years old now. Um, that won an Oscar, and, uh, and rightly so, and it was an amazing film. This is only his third film, I think. You know, in all these years, uh, The Lives of Others was his first. I can't remember offhand what his second was. I think this is his third film. So, you know what? If you're a fan of the director or you're curious or whatever, you're a masochist, check it out, 188 minutes. So the story begins in 1937 Dresden where six-year-old Kurt Barnard, he already knows he wants to be an artist when he grows up. And along with his eccentric Aunt Elizabeth, played by Saskia Rosendahl, who we saw last year, the year before, in the film We Are Young, We Are Strong. I reviewed it. It came to Hong Kong. She was also in the film Lore, L-O-R-E, which was here, 
I think I brought it to Hong Kong, actually, about five, six years ago. I think I brought it to Hong Kong. Um, I certainly saw it. It was a good film. Um, so anyhow, so along with his eccentric Aunt Elizabeth, he visits an art museum where the docent decries modern art as being degenerate. Um, now, as much as the Nazis would like to shape public opinion uh, to their own vision of what art is, Elizabeth tells the boy, never look away because there is beauty. In any, everything that is true is beautiful. Then fast forward to, to after the war's end, and Dresden is now piles of rubble. I don't know if you know, in the war it, it was very heavily bombed, basically reduced to, to rubble. Um, and, and the city is now under Soviet control. And Kurt, who's now played by the wonderful Tom Schilling, he was in the film Who Am I, which I also reviewed a couple years ago. Very, very, very young German actor. Uh, oh, not, not really a very, very good young German actor. He's now an art student who hand paints socialist propaganda posters, you know, these long posters in uh, red with white lettering, you know, these propaganda posters. And it's part of his apprenticeship at the school. One day he meets Ellie, played by Paula Beer. She was in a really good film I reviewed a couple years ago, a couple of years ago called France, F-R-A-N-T-Z. Um, it's in German and French, if I remember correctly. Um, she plays a young fashion design student, and the two characters quickly fall in love. But he is unaware, though, that her father, the professor Carl Sieban, played by the wonderful Sebastian Koch, who was in Belcanto, he was in Fog in August, he was in The Danish Girl, he was in in the shadow, and most people in the West would know him from TV's Homeland uh, from a few years ago. German guy. Fabulous actor. Um, and he, she, so he doesn't know, Kurt doesn't know that Ellie's father was a Nazi doctor, and he, the doctor, murdered a member of Kurt's family. So he doesn't know this, but we do. Now, although Kurt excels at the academy in socialist realist painting, that was the style of art, the Soviet style of art, he comes to realize that this isn't the type of art that he wants to do. And just before the Iron Curtain goes up between the East and the West, 1961, he and Ellie flee to the West and they end up in Dusseldorf where he gets accepted to the city's art academy. He's already 30 years old, which is, and he has to lie about his age because it's, it's really too old in, in many people's minds that he should be still studying. Excuse me a second. Early in the morning. And, um, but, you know, he's so talented that they accept him to the academy anyways. Now, he, there, the academy, it's very much avant-garde art. He's never seen anything like it before. And he struggles to find his artistic voice in this free and open environment. And his breakthrough finally comes when he sees a photo in the newspaper of a captured Nazi doctor. <coughs> of a captured Nazi doctor. <coughs> not not um, um, Ellie's father. Now, I didn't know this as I watched the film. And it made my watching rather, I don't want to say challenging, head-scratching. Let's put it that way, head-scratching. Now I know. I did my research. <laughs> Makes a lot more sense. This film is very loosely based on the life of German painter Gerhard Richter. I have cousins who are Richters. Maybe we're related. And although the artist, Richter, was very quick to distance himself from this project as soon as the film was released. Now, the, the director said that he read the screenplay to the artist just to make sure that he got the story right, and the artist didn't say anything, so he says, okay, therefore must be right, and the artist is saying, I never said that I'm a part of this film. So, uh, <laughs> very interesting. I think Richter's now 87 or something like this. So, if you're not familiar with Richter or his work, and, and I have to admit, Although I am familiar with his work, I wasn't familiar with him. I, I, um, I had seen his work before and I didn't make the connection. So if you're not familiar with, with his work or him, you would be well advised to do some basic research on him before you see this film. Otherwise, you're going to be scratching your head the way I was. Because the you think the film is going in this direction and it goes in this direction. And then it goes back to this direction. <laughs> Then it goes back to this direction. And as I'm watching the film, so I was watching the film and thinking, what is this film about? <laughs> you know? And 
it's about an artist. You don't think it's going to be about an artist. You think it's going to be about Nazis, but it's not. It's about an artist. <laughs> so, and, uh, you know, and unfortunately, you know, the film spans the first hour, pretty close to the first hour, on little Kurt, the, the six-year-old or the five-year-old, however old he was. And then it suddenly, you know, 1937, then it suddenly jumps in time to 1945. And then again, like, it suddenly jumps in time to, I think, 1953 or something. I can't remember the exact year. And, and it happens so fast that as I was watching it, I'm thinking, I think somebody screwed up here. Like, you know, in the old days when we had film reels, I thought maybe somebody switched a reel. Like, maybe I missed something. But actually, you don't. You, it all it, it eventually all makes sense. But the jumps are so jarring, and there's not a lot. There's not a lot to connect them. It's sort of almost the, you know. In retrospect, it's presented like vignettes. You know, in the life of this young man. Um, but it's it's not done to me. It's not done very well. But it you know as I said, eventually it does make sense. So you know what? It's going to try. You're unless you really know about this artist, or you're you're you know you're familiar with. The artist's work, and this is really going to try your patience. Fortunately, the film does move just barely fast enough that you're not going to turn it off. At least I didn't turn it off or walk out. Um, and and uh, the performances are all very, very good. You know, Koch always does a great job. Schilling is a wonderful actor, as I said. I saw him in Who Am I? He was really good in that. And Paula Beer, also shoot in France. Um, she's also a very, very good actress. So the, the performances are really good. You know, Donnie's Mark gets good performances out of his actors. His cinematographer, who was, who was nominated for an Oscar, does beautiful cinematography. You know, so it was, it's a well-made film. It's a well-acted film. It's just three hours and eight minutes long. And you wonder where it's going. It gets there, but you just watch where it's going. So, you know, I, I I, look, this is not a film for everybody, uh, but I think it's it's a really good film. Um, I wouldn't call it a masterpiece by any means, unlike my more influential colleagues. Uh, I wouldn't call this a masterpiece because it's it needs editing, in my opinion. It really needs... I You know, and I was thinking afterwards, how do you edit this? Because this is this guy's life story. If you edit it, you're cutting out part of his life. Um, but t honestly, I think there were scenes that really went very, you know, really protracted scenes that probably could have used, you know, a minute cut here, a minute cut there. I don't know. I, I think perhaps maybe if it was two hours, I don't know how he could have made this story into a two-hour film because this is a very interesting life this man led. Um, but three hours and eight minutes is too long. So that's my opinion on Never Look Away. Um, it's coming. If, you, if it's not coming to where you are, um, it is showing up on Amazon Prime next week. So no news on when it's coming to Netflix, um, but Amazon Prime next week. So you don't have to go to the cinema. You can watch it at home if you um, if you have Amazon Prime, if you're a subscriber. So never look away. All right. Second film, which opened yesterday, is called The Hustle. And it's very interesting. You know, in America, I'm so glad I don't live in America. <laughs> you know, but... <laughs> In America, you know, you have this constitutional crisis going on now where, with, where information is being withheld from the people. And, you know, when that happens, there's a reason for it. Like, maybe they don't want us to know what that information is. Well, Universal Studios, who's the, make, is the studio that made this film, The Hustle, they put an embargo on film critics who saw this film. And we weren't allowed to talk about the film or, or publicly, you know, publish our reviews until yesterday. Now, I saw the film. What they do here in Hong Kong is they don't show us. Universal, typically, is the one that does this. They don't show us the film until the day of the release or, at best, the night before to mitigate, you know, their, their risk. And so, you know, for films like any of the Avengers films, we usually see the day of. The Star Wars films, we see the day of. Um, and then other films they'll show us the night before because they don't want us to to publish our reviews and trash them, <laughs> trash their movies. Uh, and that that was the case here. So they had a, they had an embargo on the on the critics for this film, The Hustle, that the people couldn't uh, review. So but now the film is out and the reviews are starting to come out. And guess what? The reason why there was an embargo on this film is because they didn't want 
the reviewers, the critics, to tell everybody what a horrible film this is. This is really, this is an awful film. Uh, it's It stars Anne Hathaway, who was in Ocean's 8 and Les Miserables. You know, everybody knows Anne Hathaway. And she plays a successful, uh, she, let's, let's say, you know, she runs a successful business in the French Riviera Resort town, <coughs> excuse me, of Beaumont-sur-Mer. There's no such place as Beaumont-sur-Mer. But <coughs> it sort of looks like Monte Carlo. Um, or sort of a downscale Monte Carlo. <clears throat> so in the French Riviera Resort town of Beaumont-sur-Mer, and she cons <clears throat> unsuspecting rich men of their money, their wealth, and um, she's done a very good business this way. Now, all this is put to risk when Penny Rust, played by Rebel Wilson, uh, people know her, the, uh, the uh, plus size, let's call her, Australian uh, actress comedian who was in the Pitch Perfect films, among others, she shows up to ply her trade in the same place. Now, although classy Josephine would like nothing better than to see Penny off of her home turf, the brash Australian proves to be a worthy adversary. And so the, the women say, well, if you can't beat him, join him. They decide to team up and work together on a few scams, which go very well. Uh, but their chalk and cheese relationship really proves short-lived. They can't work together. So the women agree that they're going to have one more scam. They're going to do one more scam together, sort of, and it's going to be winner take all. And the prize is that the loser has to leave town. And their objective is to see who can bilk Thomas Westerberg, played by Alex Sharp. He was in an amazing uh, indie film that I did, that I reviewed last year called To the Bone, starring Lily Collins. Um, so their objective is to bilk this character, who is a young tech entrepreneur, out of a half a million dollars first. So whoever gets a half a million dollars out of, out of him first is the winner, and the loser has to leave town. Now... If the premise of this film sounds familiar, it's because it's a gender-based reversal of a, re and a remake, um, or what do they call it? Gender reverse. That's what they call it. Gender reversed remake of the 1988 film Dirty Rotten Scoundrels that starred Michael Caine and Steve Martin playing similar uh, roles. Um, now, that film, FYI, was a remake of a 1964 film called Bedtime Story that starred David Niven and Marlon Brando. Seems like, a, I've never seen the film, seems like a very unlikely uh, combination of actors. Um, I should actually try and get to see the film. And Bedtime Story, uh, unlike its two successors, uh, 1964, has a very sort of Hollywoodish ending, which the other two stories don't have. Um, you know, I can see it's a very much a product of, of the time that they couldn't, they wouldn't be able to make a story like that back in 1964. So, I should try to see it. It's called Bedtime Story. Right? Um, now, the hustle pr follows the storyline of Dirty Rotten Scandals really closely, like almost like scene for scene. There's not a lot that's changed between the two films. What has changed is, of course, the genders. Uh, there's been a few updates for the time that we live in, including the amount of cash involved in the in the scam. You know, here it's a half a million dollars. I think in Dirty Rotten Scoundrels it was $50,000 or something. I can't remember what it was. And, of course, in uh, Bedtime Story it was far less. So, inflation. Uh, in this one also there's a gag involving peer-to-peer -peer transactions, which, of course, didn't exist even a few years ago. So, uh, so that, you know, there. And there's also a fair bit of raunchy talk. Now, this film apparently um, had gotten a an R rating in the States, and then Rebel Wilson, who apparently, I didn't know that she was a lawyer before she was an actress, she argued to the, what do they call it, the MPAA? The, this is the, uh, the body that uh, gives out the ratings in America. She argued that they were being unfair uh, because this is a women, female-centric film. In, in other words, like, why can't females, why can't women be as raunchy as men. If this film was, her argument was, if this film starred men saying the exact same thing, it wouldn't get the R rating. And she's absolutely right. So they they agreed with her, and they and it got dropped down to a PG thirteen rating. Um, you know, I have to say, yes, it is very raunchy. But you know, when I hear six year olds saying stuff these days that 
I would have had my mouth washed out with soap if I had said those things. So, uh, you know what? Unfortunately, she was right. The times have changed. Now, so as I said, this follows this, the, the story of Dirty Rotten Scoundrels to the letter, except it's not funny. Whereas that was funny. This one really is not funny. Now, in terms of the raunchy talk, most of it comes from Wilson. Her, she's built her career on this. Hi, I'm fat. I'm horny. I'm vulgar. You know, this is her, her you know, she's like an Australian uh, Amy Schumer. I don't like Amy Schumer's humor. I don't like Rebel Wilson's humor. You know what? It, it's questionable whether it was funny the second time we saw it on the screen. It was questionable whether we, if it was funny the fifth time we saw it on the screen. It's not funny here. Uh, I, I just... You know, and you know, there are a few people in my audience who were, you know, at the beginning, everybody, not everybody, you know, I wasn't laughing. A few people, you know, guys next to me were, were laughing, and then the audience got progressively quieter and quieter and quieter as the film went on, because it's really a horrible film. Now, um, for Hathaway's part, although she's supposed to play the straight woman to Wilson's over-the-top performance, she doesn't have the comedic chops to, to pull this off, you know, this... I, you know, and I even read something the other day, yesterday, I guess it was, that, you know, there was so much improv, improv going on because of Rebel Wilson. And, you know, you would expect that. And, and you know, if you're dealing in improv, you know, that is a skill to be able to react like this. She really struggled with it. And you can, you know, you can see that she struggled with it. So, you know, not good. You know, she was not the right person for this role. And, you know, what I, I, I feel... I don't want to say I feel sorry for her because you know what she's she's done it very well in her career. But you know what she's struggling to redefine herself. She's now thirty six years old, which in Hollywood is old, unfortunately. And she's you know she's built her career on playing these ingenues, you know these young waifs, these innocent people. She can't do that now. She's thirty six years old, so she needs to try to find a new you know she has to have uh, directors see her in a new light. So she's trying new things. So I give her credit for trying it. This was not the right film for her. Now, the film is directed by Chris Adderson, who comes from Wales. He's a one-time, or let's say not one time, he's a former stand-up comedian, and he's directed a number of episodes of the TV show Veep, among other things. So, you know, his background is TV directing. This is his first studio film. It might have been too much for him to handle. I think that this really, you know, maybe Wilson is such a such a force of nature. He, he couldn't handle it. Um, you know, I think, as I said, the film really does not have a lot of laughs. I guffawed a couple of times. Thank God the film is only 94 minutes, although uh, my colleague said it seemed like a lot longer. It, you know what? It was, it was 94 minutes of pain, but thank God it was only 94 minutes. <laughs> you know, But clearly, Addison doesn't know when to say it's a wrap. That just when the story should rightfully end he tacks on an epilogue that adds nothing to the story. You know, it's like, we've, we've had our closing laugh. We get it. We know where the story, you know, it's wrapped up very nicely. We know that this is what their future will bring. And then he has this other thing where it just says, oh, in, in case you missed the last five minutes, here's another version of what you just saw. You know, a different version, you know, different version, but, you know, same, same message. And it's like, yeah, we got it. We don't need to see that. We got that. So, and, and then, and then, like, to really rub salt in the wound, there's a post credit scene, like, what is this, The Avengers? There's a post credit scene that was deleted from the final cut that says, you know, maybe he's trying to say, well, if you love what you just saw, you're really going to love this. And, you know, it's just the opposite. There's a reason why this scene was cut. It's garbage. So, basically, you know, if, he's, if he was trying to get people to, to exit the cinema with a smile on their face, if they had one before this... This post credit scene just wiped it off their faces. I mean, it's, 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 you know, oh, it's horrible, horrible, horrible. So Universal, at least here, I don't know about anywhere else, but they're pitching this film to female moviegoers. You know, they're saying female-centric, you know, you love Dan Hathaway in this film, you love Rebel Wilson in that film, you're going to love this film too. I'm not sure how sound a plan that is, a strategy that is, given how raunchy this dialogue is and how flat the film is. This is, this is not going to make them money. They'll probably lose money off of this. Don't even bother to wait for it to go to a streaming service or an in-flight entertainment system, which will happen in about two weeks, I'm sure. It will not stay in the cinemas for very long. 
keep your money in your pocket because the hustle is one big con. That's all. That's it for the hustle. Horrible film. That's it for this week. Don't know what I'm doing next week. Um, can't remember. Oh, I know. The Arc the What's it called? Arctic. I haven't seen it yet, but I know I'm talking about that one next week. Have a good week. Bye.